Hi there. Welcome to What Happens Next. I'm Ben. I'm Philip. And mate, I have a big topic to discuss with you today. It's a DM. Okay, I better get comfortable. It may be the ultimate what happens next. Wow. Well it's only fitting. I mean, this is our insert number episode. <laughs> it's about time for a bit of retrospection. Yeah, well, that's the coincidentally the question I wanted to ask you. Oh, okay. I want to talk to you about the idea of looking backwards, not forwards. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Yeah, so someone who may dwell on the past and by doing so are afraid of failure so they don't actually progress with their life or someone who may have colloquially peaked in high school and like the famous Uncle Rico character in Napoleon Dynamite who <laughs> who's in his <laughs> mid-40s still replaying the final football game of his career in high school and if only the coach put me in fourth quarter, we could have gone state as he famously keeps repeating throughout the film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Uncle Rico would be a classic in terms of someone spending more time looking back than looking forward. <laughs> but I think we all do it to a certain extent and it is fun to do. It's a bit therapeutic to do at times, but perhaps it may also be counterproductive to a fruitful life. Do you do it yourself much? Do you tend to reflect back in regards to nostalgia, which is the positive way of doing that, or the negative version is the shoulda, woulda, coulda yeah. idea of looking back and looking at missed opportunities, or had I pivoted left instead of right, I might have ended up here, or had mm. I done that, not this, I would have ended up there. Do you tend to do either I th- of those? I think I do a bit. I think I do a bit of both, but I think I'm probably better at keeping it to a nostalgic, indulgent. What about when? How good was that? When we were like that X Y Z, as opposed to oh shit, you know, if only I'd stayed at uni longer or done a different degree, or if only I hadn't spent so much time with that girl who ultimately broke my heart, or you know, that sort of. For example, no, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about someone else. <laughs> No, it's funny, isn't it? It's basically the negative and positive version of the same thing. Yeah. And you might not realize that you're doing it because you think, what's wrong with that? But maybe it just sort of digs up all this negativity or positivity, but it's positivity in the past. You know, like I remember talking to you once where we were talking about our lives and getting quite involved in a big D&M and it became apparent that we had been out of school for longer than we had been alive when we left school. Yeah. That's when you sort of go, uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, school is such a massive part of your life, but once you've been away from it for that period of time, it's defining in a way and it can have a big impact on how you turn out and it can impact on your friends and your, and your lifestyle afterwards, but it can also have a negative impact on you if you let it. And I think a lot of people who may have been bullied at school or didn't achieve what they wanted out of school can let it sort of govern how they live their life. Whereas if you can just see it for what it is and- you are still in it, no matter what happened at school, you're still in a position to make the most out of your life if you want to. It may be easy for you if you got a good mark at school or if you had certain upbringing, parental guidance, et cetera. But anyway, I think it can all sort of, it all sort of feeds into that sort of the constant reflecting back. And I think it depends on where you are in the present. So if you're moving forward like a shark and not stopping, and we're not just moving forward, but moving forward and doing things that you like, it's like two things. You've mm. got to actually. Enjoy what you're doing Mm. and also be moving forward. Sometimes you can be moving forward doing things you don't like Mm. and sometimes you can be doing things you like but not moving forward. And then the dream is to do both, right, Mm. to move forward and do things you like. But if you're doing something you don't like and you're also not moving forward, which is a double whammy, I think that's when you naturally then reflect backwards to better times where you were doing one or the other. Yeah. Something you liked or you felt there was a sense of change and movement. Yeah. And you were the shark with the water passing over your gills, making progress. Mm. And I think it's really interesting because I I raised this whole topic, by the way, because I'm fascinated that we do that and I'm annoyed at myself for doing that. It's both a general observation about people, it's me, yeah. but I'm also a victim of it. Yeah. I wasn't the school jock that scored the winning try or the winning six on the last ball of cricket or- you No? Know. No. Oh. no. I, I, I scored two. Oh. <laughs> I had other successes at school in other oh. ways, like academia and art and so Chicks. on. Chicks. at the Catholic boys' school. <laughs> <laughs> Brothers. The teachers. Priests, yeah. <laughs> but- I do think it's amazing that when you've got condensed periods in your life, such as school, 
Another good example for both of us is college at university. You can be somewhere for only a tiny window in proportion to the rest of your life, let's say one or two years. Or you rent, you rent with a particular flatmate or flatmates for six to 12 months. Yeah. Yet because it's been such a formative, intense experience, it yeah. feels like it's got a weight or a value beyond that time period. Yeah. Like I look back at college, for example, and a couple of group houses, and I was only in each of those for one year. But it has left a resonance or a scar or a wonderful memory groove hmm. that is so disproportionate to other years of my life, which just fly by. I can look to the early 2000s and yeah. go, where did that year go? But another example is I worked with Hugh briefly post-school and I'd see you every day and I was in that job where we'd work and spend lunch times together and go for walks and chit-chat and so on. You go traveling and with your boss and whatever. That was only for six months. That, to me, feels like I was there for five years. Yeah. Because intense, like yeah. school or uni, it's every day. Yeah. And it was different to everything else that you've done in a way. Like, yep. that sort of working for him was quite unique in that. Yeah. And same for me. Like, I was there for a bit longer than you, but just a little bit. And it resonates because of that. But once you sort of get into a grind and you have- Not a grind. It's not always a grind, but it's more like the last- Eight months of my life have just flown by. And unless you, unless you've got some, you know, major milestones or major holidays, or you buy or sell a house, or you change suburbs, like you know, someone dies, yeah, uh, there's you fall not, in love. There's not a lot to break it up sometimes, and so you tend to find yourself dwelling a bit on those really formative years of your life where you were in that crazy share house, or you had that cool job, and you were doing all those great things, and yeah, but. Is that a healthy thing or is it a – or is too much of it unhealthy, I suppose, is the question. That's the balance. See, the question is, are you looking back and yearning for what you don't have anymore hmm. or are you looking back and perhaps taking lessons from the past and saying, oh, okay, I was happy at this point. I'm not as happy now. What can I learn from what I did beforehand? Yeah. So, it's constructive. Hmm. But you're trying to like reflect on it to then apply those lessons – to the future. So, let's just say, for example, you're in an office job and you're sitting down in your bum all day and you're feeling really just slobbish and whatever because your job's very static. Mm. But you look back at when you used to like ride your bike around much more for public transport and your job involved standing and sitting and moving around and you just felt more active. Like that'd be an example of saying, yeah, you know what? I don't go to the gym anymore. I don't ride my bike. I kind of drive. I catch public transport. My job's very sedentary. Like there are examples where you can look back and say, okay, I clearly did something right that made me feel better about myself and my health, my weight and my, you know, psychological state. The danger, I suppose, is when you look back, yearn for it, don't do anything in the present to change where you are. And it just becomes this case of like watching the movie Face Off or Con Air on loop over and over and over. It's this guilty pleasure. It doesn't actually create any positive change in the present. More guilty than pleasure in my case. <laughs> yeah, that's, it. that's it. I do it a lot. But it also do with other people. So, yeah, yeah. one thing I've always done, I'm very ambitious, always have been. And because I've always had this aspiration in terms of my filmmaking and I have various idols in filmmaking like directors and writers, what I often do is I look at the age that certain people were when they reached a particular point of success in their life and then I reflect on me. So, I recall when I was at uni and I think when I was at uni, my last year of uni in my mid-20s, it was at the same age that Paul Thomas Anderson did his first film, Sydney, otherwise known as Hard Eight. And at 27, he released Boogie Nights, which is phenomenal, right? Most people's lives are pretty simple and straightforward and they don't actually- They're still trying to find their way. Yeah. And he's releasing this opus- multi-narrative, multi-character drama over three hours, which is written and directed, which is amazing. So, for me, my danger is I can turn to other idols in my life and see when they achieve their points of success like Barack Obama or Martin Scorsese or someone, and then that can inspire me. But as I get older and then you realise that a lot of people you revere have reached those points in their life beyond 25, 30, 35, 40 – then what happens is you start becoming a bit more despondent because you sort of feel like time's running out because you're closer to the age that, let's just say, Barack Obama was when he became president than when he graduated from university or something like that. Oh, no pressure. I agree with what you were saying in terms of you tend to indulge in nostalgia with other people who were there with you at the time or who are similarly nostalgic about those types of times, like the share house living or all that kind of vibe. But 
I think there's also a, a third category, which can be the person who he or she doesn't so much live in the present as a sort of a conscious decision as more of someone who just just kind of drifts along, you know, without a huge amount of ambition, without a huge amount of goal setting. So, there isn't reflection either into the past or the future. Yeah. So, there's- Right. And they can quite happily think about their time, at, you know, in their past without any sort of judgment or- Envy. Envy, yeah. Or no, no sort of, oh, I wish I'd done that or why, why did I do that, you know. doesn't beat themselves up too much about it. They just look back on it for what it was and- and it's almost like everything I've done in my life is living to this point and it's all happened for a reason and why try and not so much. There are certain decisions you can make to sort of get where you want to be but also things aren't too bad and, you know, let's just see where they go and I don't know. There's also that third category anyway is what I was trying to say. So, that's where I'm very different to those people. I'm not saying I'm better or worse. Mm. No, actually, I'm a bit judgmental about it. I am. It's okay. I, I am. Let's I am. call a spade a spade. No, I, I am. I am. I'm pretty ambitious in most parts of my world. And so, my fear would to end up being that drifting person. Hmm. And the reason why I do reflect backwards and forwards, like ping pong, basically, I'm looking at the future, the present, the past, the past, the present, the future, and so on. So, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to measure where I am now hmm. as to where I want to be. Hmm either practically or in a dream sense, where I have come from. So, I'm doing that ping pong reflection and projection Mm -hmm. to try and calibrate my level of success or the odds of of reaching that target. You reflect back on where you've walked. You look back on the map and say, I've come from here, come to there. You look, see how long it took you and you go, okay, in five years I achieved this and this. Therefore, in the next two years, I could do that. So, my nightmare is to not look forward or backwards and just drift, looking basically only one foot in front of me because then I don't feel you can- How do you know where you're going if you don't look ahead? Now, you can't steer a direction if you don't actually look to the horizon or choose a North Star in the sky yeah, and say, th- sail that way. You just basically get the winds of the winds of the ocean I think, I think you're drifting a, nowhere. You're, you're in a, an enviable position in that you are a creative person with creative passions, but you're also very smart business-wise, intellectually-wise. You're not just some crazy writer locked away in your, in your cabin in the woods with a typewriter typing up screenplays. You are actually- Calculating and methodical and, and disciplined, etc. Yeah, it's a weird dichotomy. I suppose. Yeah, I, I think there's it's not a bit unusual. There's probably not a lot of people who have those two types of skills that you yeah, have because it tends to be a bit of left brain, right brain at the same time. Yeah, there's a problem with that though. Is that what happens is you tend to perhaps curb excelling at one or the other mm. because you're kind of kept in check by the other. Mm-hmm. So, you don't perhaps go off to the very end of the road with, say, a creative project because pragmatism reigns you in or vice versa. You yeah. don't kind of go down the other side of the road because you're just not stimulated, you're bored, it seems too dry and so that kind of brings you back. So, it has its pros and cons. But yeah, I think it's right. Like plenty of artists I know would pursue something from their heart and park their head on the side. Yeah. They wouldn't even park their head consciously. They'd just- Follow their heart by as a life hmm. choice, and hmm. for better or worse, turns out okay, yeah. or it just doesn't work out at all because they haven't forecasted potential potholes in the road to that journey. So, what happens next if you're in a situation and you're the sort of person who does have the danger of looking back too much and not in a fun, nostalgic, let's shoot the breeze, have a few beers, tell stories kind of a way, but more into which of- is fun. Which is fun, but more in a way that's basically a ball and chain to the present. What would you recommend people do to try and still maintain the fun side of nostalgic chit chat and reflection, but without that hindrance that yeah, it's, it's curbs sort of, their future ambitions? It's sort of not getting lost in thinking that it's hard for people not to think that you know they think about their first great love or their you know how great it was. It, at school or how great it was in those years after school when you had all that freedom before you had a mortgage and kids and I'll go back there and and that can sort of lead to some dangerous life choices as you get older with that sort of Pollyanna outlook on, on, on the past whereas I think accepting it for what it was and that it was formative to an extent but also it's not a sentence. It doesn't mean – doesn't destine you to – 
to a certain way of life or a certain path that, that you can you can stop and choose your own way and to you know obviously to a certain extent depending on <laughs> your finances or your partner or your children or however your employment you know you can always have a tree change or a seed change or pick up everyone and put them in a camper van or or you know work part-time while you pursue that artistic passion or whatever it is and and you you know there are numerous examples of people who have been in a similar position to you and have packed it all in to do a complete u-turn and accepting on that that you are the master of your own destiny in a way i think you nailed it earlier with that reference to finances and kids and debt and mortgage and whatever i think what comes down is that when you're younger you've got less balls and chain Mm. so when you think about it when you finish school you don't have any debt you don't have any money so there's no fall there's no money to spend to buy yourself into further debt you generally don't have a relationship that's very long or deep so you're not bound there you don't have children you don't have a job which you're fearful of losing so essentially you don't have any incumbences on your life which means when you want to pivot left or right to try and change your mind to pursue alternative opportunities there isn't much collateral damage if you do Mm. as you get older you basically build up a war chest of obligations, debt. That could include emotional debt, for example, in a relationship, whether you're really happy or not, like the positive or the negative. Children, obviously. And then you're just less free to make those choices and change mm. it. And if you can pull the pin on the grenade, and like you gave the example, you know, you decide to go, you buy a van and travel Australia for six to 12 months or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. But again, that requires having the financial freedom to do that. Or if not the financial freedom, the financial courage to sell up, to not have any debt, and then just say, you know what, we're going to spend our meager savings on travel or something like mm-hmm. that. And mm-hmm. I do think that everyone, including myself, who does that, I doubt that they regret it. Yeah. I think it's like exercise where many people don't feel motivated to actually hit the gym or pull their sneakers and go for a run. But of course, no one after exercises says, oh, that was shit. Like everyone always feels great after exercising, Hmm. but it's just pushing the boulder up the hill to get to the gym or to hit the pavement in the first place Mm -hmm. before you actually reach the the high, the endorphins flowing afterwards. And I think that's the same you apply with like career, mortgage. Let's think about like, let's say you've got kids and they go to a private school. There's that commitment as well. You move to a suburb, you make friends with the neighbors. And now you think, well, if I pull up stumps and move, I've got to make new friends. So yep. now I've, I've got these emotional attachments here. Why don't I just stay here yep. and stay with the friends that I already have and know? And so you don't move. So you end up staying somewhere like, you know, those particular parochial suburbs like Manly or Northern Beaches in Sydney or Cronulla, where people, for many good reasons, stay because this is such a strong sense of community, they don't want to pull up stumps and move. Yeah. And I think it takes a lot of courage. I don't think it's gutless. I think it's actually courageous to try and blow things up metaphorically Hmm. and just kind of do something. Absolutely, yeah. And I think if you do sell up and you do move and you are then, I guess, taking a more minimal existence where you minimise, you sell down your stuff in the garage, you've got less clothes, and that's another podcast to get back to my (laughs) idea of minimalism. But basically, the less you have, which includes relationships and everything, the less collateral damage there is if you decide to do a sharp left and abandon the current course that your life's on. Mm-hmm. It's just that that's easier said than done. And if you do that, people think, well, when I come back from my six to 12-month camper van holiday, yeah. oh, I've got to buy back into the market, where do I live, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. There are certainly people now who, if you've got a pretty tidy body and your missus has got a pretty tidy body, you know, you can Airbnb at your house for the year, parlay the, that money into a, a Sprinter van renovation and- you can live off the Instagram fame <laughs> that you could garner from 12 months. Have holiday. we discussed van life yet? Yeah, but it's pretty much, I mean- Have you, we? Yeah. On the podcast? Oh, uh, Maybe not on the podcast, but you're pretty much <laughs> destined to a coastal 12 months because you basically both got to be wearing swimming costumes <laughs> all the time, unless you're following some pretty nice warm warm water billabongs or lagoons or something to swim And in. a very uh, big expense account and fake tan, or do yeah. you naturally be- of a more olive complexion. That all helps. You know, spend six months, a bit of forward planning, get yourself into a bit of buff conditioning. Obviously, get the missus on a bit of a- <laughs> Low carb. Low, 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 low carb, <laughs> high fake tan diet. And, you know, with a bit of- Blonde cre- tips. Some appropriate angles and some filtering, you can- Some good poses. Some duck can, face. 
bit of duck face. Some, you could probably live off that Instagram fame for 12 months. Have we discussed that idea that I mentioned to you in a podcast about us selling up, living in Sydney and You and buying? me. Yeah. Yeah. You and me selling. No, <laughs> that's what you and I <laughs> running off into abandoning the sunset. our families. <laughs> Podcasting from the back of a van yeah. every day. Every day. Every day. Just calling it a, as it is. A podcast a day. It's not bad. It's like vitamin C, right? Hold that thought. Exactly. That's some serious oral nutrition for the citizens of Australia and the world. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> no, it is funny because I started following hashtag van life. These families, like one's called the Bucket List family that travel and document their journeys on YouTube in a very kind of iMovie Stock music, kind of corny, badly edited, cheesy way. Totally isn't see a people, lovely family of three kids, and they've spent three years, I think, traveling around the world. And I follow van lifers who aren't hot young 20 somethings, but more like families with a couple of kids buying a van. And I, we came really close. I haven't quite ruled it out, but for about 12 months up until just recently, we came really close to thinking, okay. If we decide to pack in our jobs hmm. or made redundant, Always we doable. sell down or if not sell down, maybe rent out. Hmm. That's the irony, I think, about living in an expensive city like Sydney in Australia that you can actually often rent or Airbnb your house for more than the mortgage repayments you can make or it more work. than the rent. Yeah, you can make it work for And it. then take that money and then go van lifing for six to 12 months around Australia. And I have thought about that and we came really close to doing it. <laughs> But recently, we pulled the pin on that whole idea because we went overseas with the kids and it was two weeks traveling with the kids, you know, full time. And I thought, you know what? I don't think I want to be around my kids <laughs> seven days a week, yeah. every week. Like, I love my kids. They're great. But- Yeah, I love your kids. They're good. Yeah. I don't need to be around them seven days a week. And also, I don't think I need to be around my beloved seven days a week and vice versa from her point of view. Like- Just quietly. We all enjoy our bit of time. Like, Don't worry, we'll edit this bit out, Penny. <laughs> we all enjoy, you know, just that one or two days a week just by ourselves. Or even if you go to work, as much as you may get frustrated by your work or your colleagues or whatever or your clients, at least you get a break as well from your beloved, your family, your kids and so on. And I've got to say, if you travel with your family and your lover seven days a week, 24-7 for months on end, hmm. It could be absolutely spectacular and you could reach a whole new connection with your family, which would be wonderful. Yep. Same time. No, incredibly we, stressful we just, and went, we just went away for the weekend and it was two and a half hours each way. Driving. Driving. And I'm not a very patient driver. And I get cabin fever after about an hour and 45 and I start- In a car. Yeah, I start singing to myself and singing out loud and making up rhymes of things to, to the music. music. Or- yeah. And- so, I think that a full you day- You could be annoying. A, yeah, a full day of that, <laughs> sort of every- <laughs> Depending on how, how often we wanted to move around with the van, but yeah, I mean, I think I'd be I'd be wearing tempers a bit thin, I think. You can't imagine like um, your beloved taking photographs of herself with her legs out and a book in front with a view of the beach with the van doors open. Oh, I can imagine it. I'm sure it will happen at one point, but not right now. I think vans are popular around Western Australia, Northern Territory in Australia and New Zealand. Hmm. I mean, Australia, like America, is kind of built for vans because big land, big stretches. It's convenient yeah. just to pull and, into a car park. And a lot of us who live on the East Coast, we've all done some of the major points along the East Coast. So, it's, if you want to, you know, if you want to challenge yourself or go somewhere really cool that you probably can't do in a car, you need to go in a van so you can stay overnight or with a tent. So, what happens Those next if you want to pull up stumps and do van life? What would be your expert advice as someone who's never done this? <laughs> someone who's never done this. Well, you've got to get yourself a good van. I think a basic mechanics course would be handy to be able to change a tire and, you know, change the oil and work out what's wrong with your engine and stuff if you break down the middle of nowhere. Some bush tucker man skills. <laughs> Uh, it depends how it depends how sort of remote you want to go. I mean, you want to go to a caravan or caravan park, then that's fine. Well, also you need the- to, you need to be able to master the art of small talk with sixty five, seven year old people <laughs> wearing thongs and <laughs> sitting in camper chairs with freaking VB stubbies in stubby having stubby conversations about the value of their superannuation plan. Yeah, and the, the towing, the towing capacity of their four wheel drive. Yeah. Oh, how many, how many newton meters of torque they get out of the um, V8 Nissan Patrol? How many liters of water yeah. they can carry? What's the uh, the voltage on their 
hot water kettle. Yeah, and what CB frequency can we find them on if we want to talk to them down the highway? My in-laws go camping around Australia for, you know, let's say four to eight weeks per year. They four-wheel drive. They've got a very small, it's like a compact four-wheel drive. It's barely a four-wheel drive. It's one of those VW, not the two rag. Tiguan. Tiguan. It might even be two-wheel drive, but basically soft has- Soft rotor. Yeah, soft rotor. It has the shell of a four-wheel drive and the illusion of- a four drawer lifestyle at a city price with probably city dynamics on the road. And they go traveling with a tent. They have a tent and they take a couple of very thin mattresses, like foam mattresses, in one of those, we call it the coffin on the roof, the uh, tula or whatever they call it. Yep. The plastic box on the roof where they put their linen and stuff. And they set up a two person tent at campsites all around Australia. And they are consistently always the only people. A camping and certainly the only people their age camping. Yeah. And everyone else is They'd there. They'd be mocked and ridiculed. Totally. Yeah. Everyone thinks they're But odd. also, they would also be a conversation starter. That's it. Yeah. Although my in laws or one of them is more introverted and probably doesn't want to converse with everyone. But they'd also at be- the caravan park. Because not, not many people would be in a tent for a long period of time like they would be. That's it. They only stay three nights at a time. But what they said really sucks now about going traveling around Australia is that when you go to a campsite, there's the powered sites and the unpowered sites. And back in the day when people had caravans before these camper vans, they'd take the caravan to the powered site where you plug it in for electricity. And everyone in a regular tent would be in the unpowered site, which generally meant that if you were in an unpowered site, it was like low lying because tents are lower. It's quieter. People aren't watching TV on the television in their caravan. Yeah, There's less light because you don't have electricity. So, it's more like a few torches and stuff. So, you see the sky and a greater sense of space. But what's happened now around Australia is that you have all these really affluent baby boomers, the most affluent generation of our times with their investment properties and so on, and their great deal with superannuation and low tax at their age. Barefoot investment followers. (laughs) And they have then bought these vans and they've spent a lot on these vans. And a lot of them have solar cells in their vans. So, when they rock up to a campsite, they're totally independent. Their mobile phone is wireless 4G. So, they pull these giant camper vans into an unpowered site. Oh, because they they pay less for that. Yeah. Mm. They save $4 per night. Mm. And suddenly, you have these people in their little two-person tents. Humming like a generator. Parked between these 12-foot high camper vans on either side of them. Mm. They say it's like basically parking in a car park at Westfield Shopping Centre. Or parking in like the truck stop. Yeah, totally. With, totally. A, with the big truck next to you just idling. And, yep. Do- yep. And, yeah. like, and hearing the wheels just grinding next to you as they move their cars in and out. Because when they get up in the morning, they'll often then drive to a national park to go for a day trip or whatever. So, they're constantly moving their vans in and out of the car park all day. Yeah. So, there's no sense of calm, tranquility. And at no. nighttime, they have their windows open, TVs blaring, air con throbbing, usually powered from their solar cells. Just apparently, it just ruins the entire experience. Mm, maybe I will stay put then. Yeah. Or what you do is what I'm a big fan of. I follow this Instagram account. The username is This Moving House. And this character is a guy who's a former set builder, I think, for TV shows. And what he's done is he's got a full-time job now converting camper vans, but it's called stealth camping. So, you basically have what appears to be a white tradie style truck. Yeah, uh, I like those ones. Yeah, Like an electrician's van, mm. but it's usually a Mercedes Sprinter or a mm. Volkswagen Crafter, I think, where you can stand up inside and they put insulation in and like basically like wooden floorboards across the bottom and often on the wall and the ceiling. And you've got two bunks and a sink and everything there. But because you don't have any windows on the side or the back, the idea is that you can park outside a gym in a- And no one identifies you as a backpacker. Exactly. Yeah. It just could be appear that you could be just a tradie van, an electrician or a plumber or something. So, you essentially then just go and use toilets at McDonald's or you join a gym and you go and have showers at- the same franchise like Fitness First all over Australia. You park in church car parks because no one bothers you there. But the idea is that you can basically park anywhere and you're just a big white van. But once you open the door, it's this whole little mini house all set up. 
it's pretty cool. And there's a sense that of like adventurousness about it. Like, you know, yeah. like it's a bit cheeky and illegal. But it also gives you flexibility and yeah, you're not beholden to stay in caravan parks only and Yeah, you park on the street anywhere. Yeah. So I would recommend what happens next. If you're someone who's thinking about doing a massive change or you've been made redundant or you decide it's worth pulling the trigger yourself on your own career and you're just feeling dissatisfied. Go for it. And you want to still perhaps keep your house if you're, you know, a mortgagee, but you still want to like leave that little safety net there. Yeah. I think going for the idea of going in a camper van, maybe just for three months. Don't be too ambitious. I think three is a good number. I was thinking number, far. I was thinking number four, yeah. Yeah. If it works out, you go for longer. But don't go, don't set up the dream of a year, which yeah. may be unrealistic. Make it three months, which is only 12 weeks, like many European holidays, many people. And then if it works out, you can always extend it or revisit somewhere and stay longer. Hmm. And then three months, if you were made redundant, for example, that would cover your redundancy, basically. Enough time to get back, get a job, move back into your house. And things don't work out, free accommodation, parking on the street. Sounds good to me. Genius. <laughs> All right, mate. Anything else you want to discuss tonight? No, Benny. I'm, I'm going to go home and start doing some van research, I think. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, you can find me. I'm Ben Phelps as my username on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and Patreon. And as always, Phil remains an enigma wrapped in a riddle who cannot be found on social media anywhere. Mate, until next time, peace out. See you, mate. Thank you. 